Today's discussion is going to focus all around the topic of digital transformation. We're going to address what is digital transformation? How does it actually work? What is it not? And uh, if you're thinking about implementing digital transformation within your organization, we're going to give you some tips and ideas on how to actually take the concept from a concept through to actual project and fruition and a positive delivery. So one of our last podcasts that we ran as a team, what was really interesting is that we discussed what is digital transformation. We all pretty much came to the conclusion that it's basically a mindset. And uh, it's a really interesting concept to, to wrap your head around the fact that transformation is really a mindset. It's basically a, it's an evolutionary principle of continuous change, continuous improvements within an organization in an effort to eventually reach strategic goals. And then when you reach those goals, it's about reevaluating, refocusing, re-evolving and moving forward on an ongoing basis. And in fact, uh, digital transformation has grown out of the principles of change management and uh, human behavioral principles themselves, because at the heart of digital transformation is actually the human being. The technology component, which a lot of people think is the the be all and end all with transformation is actually only there to enable what we want uh, to achieve. And in fact, it's the human being and it's the business procedures and processes and the habits that drive forward uh, evolutionary digital transformation and which can actually achieve the outcomes you want to achieve within an organization. Does anyone want to add anything to that before I sort of move on to talk about what it is not? In, in the real world, we're all good. Um, so we, we've spoken about what it is. And as I said before, it's a process of change where the human being is, is at the center. And that's the critical thing that I wanna just really quickly discuss because digital transformation is not web development. It is not digital marketing. It may have components of web development. And in fact, we may need to undergo a web development project as part of digital transformation. And we may need to review and evolve our digital marketing. But at the end of the day, those two separately are not digital transformation activities. Now, digital transformation is actually a profession onto itself. And anyone claiming to be a digital transformation expert or a professional needs to be able to back up their claims in my view. And I just wanted to set this one clear because there's a lot of individuals out there at the moment, a lot of agencies, firms touting this uh, as a practice that they do. But in fact, when you dig deeper, they have a total misunderstanding in terms of, of what it really is. And so what I would say to you is that if you're looking at going down the path of digital transformation and you're talking to specialists about this, make sure that they can back themselves up by being able to demonstrate to you what their digital transformation framework looks like and how it actually encompasses a whole of business approach. And really importantly, how does that framework uh, lean upon evolutionary principles so that change management is an importantly uh, considered factor within the actual transformation process. Because at the end of the day, as I said before, technology enables, but it's the people that we actually need to bring along on the journey. And it's the people's mindsets that we need to be changing along the way and their behaviors in order to get the outcomes that we want to get. And in fact, um, you know, Chris, if I think about some of the engagements that you and I have worked on and we've spoken about, what's interesting for me is that looking at digital transformation, it's almost like uh, leadership change management. It's almost like leadership coaching, whereby here we're not talking about the leader per se, but we're looking at an organization, a team perhaps that's going to be impacted upon by the technology. And we're coaching and guiding the team through a process of change management internally in their minds so that they're accepting the new technology. They're not pushing back. They're accepting the new way forward. And therefore they're going to enable to the, the project to actually succeed. Is, is that uh, yeah. sort of a similar view that you've seen? Well, well, that's what I'd like to see. But what, what we see, as you know, Peter, is we often see companies where the IT person considers themselves the digital expert or the, or the owner of the business or the manager or CEO basically sees something and says, oh, that's a good idea. I think we'll have Microsoft Teams tomorrow. Mm. And all of a sudden, everybody gets an instruction to log on and you know, become part of the Microsoft Teams. And 
nobody's really trained. Nobody really understands the whole holistic picture. They don't, they don't take a group of the company, say two or three people and say, right, you are going to be the, the people that we're going to test all this on to make sure that it functions. And we maintain a control group and we see if this is right for us or not. I mean, we're all a little guilty of it because most of this technology that we're using is still beta, I'd say, and it's, you know, it's changing rapidly. So what might have been good yesterday is not necessarily good today, but there does, I'm, I'm definitely noticing it that companies just make a decision and they don't really bring their teams along with the decision and they don't let their team understand why the decision was made in the first place. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's often just because it's new technology, let's do it, it must be good. Yeah. It's, so, it's uh, interesting because Ken, from a project's point of view, and, and you know, James and Farah, you and I, we've seen different things in terms of projects. And look, I, I've been um, at fault with this at times. You get really excited by stuff and you just want to go forward and you know jump into things. Um, but certainly jumping into things, as we all know from a project point of view, isn't the right approach. And same thing with digital transformation as well. There is a, a path that we need to go down. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes it is the path that the business owner and the team doesn't want to go down because it's just too hard. It's too laborious. It's, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I just want to, can't we just use it? Can you just turn it on? Um, but it, it doesn't really, doesn't really work that way. So. I think uh, where we should probably start is really talking about um, where should digital transformation start? And from my perspective, and this is you know, through years and years of trial and error, what I found is that you actually can't deploy um, or implement an appropriate digital transformation strategy unless you actually understand what your business strategy is as a high level. And so when I look at undertaking digital transformation or when a client contacts me about that sort of work, the first thing I ask them is, okay, great, let's do it. But let me ask you this, what does your business strategy say? Where do you want to be positioned or where do you want to position yourself? Where do you want to be as an organization in three, four, five years time? And let's analyze that position and then let's understand how transformation fits in and where it needs to fit in as opposed to let's just go down the path of transformation without actually aligning it to the greater uh, organizational uh, strategic goals, for example. Um, has anyone sort of seen anything different to this or have you sort of experienced something that, that might be a bit different to this? I think as we're going to talk through different examples, the, um, there are different paths in terms of this digital transformation from top down to bottom up, uh, to finding some success with blockchain and, and the finance department and then extending it um, to other divisions. So I think what I agree with what you're saying is you really need to know where you, you want to go uh, and what that other models in your industry that, that might be good examples or even across industry that, that you think uh, could be a good model of transformation that gets better customer service and better customer experience uh, within your company. Uh, that's the starting place, knowing where you, you want to go, uh, then going on to, to saying, here is where we're at, at right now, and here's a, a pragmatic yet ambitious path and some milestones along the way uh, to get us to that end in, in state. And, mm. and along the way, Focusing very much on the on the mindset and the acceptance of change, because, uh, for example, with one small company that I've dealt with um, here on the Gold Coast, they um, they weren't really uh, open to to change until they experienced some some positive uh, outcomes by working in different ways. They, they were very skeptical at first, but when they were able to to, to see that they needed to build in a path of continual improvement, uh, then they were able to, to say, hey, yeah, that makes sense. Mm. Let's uh, challenge some of our other processes and, and bring those uh, up to modern day practices. Uh... And I think, uh, sorry, Peter, along the lines of what Ken was saying, I, I maybe had a question. Does every digital transformation start with the question, how are we trying to grow our business? Is that why a digital transformation project comes into play? Um, is, is that always the case? Or is it sometimes that 
we are not where we think we need to be as a business. Um, there's something holding us back from getting to the next level or some things that we are have working in efficiently. So what really triggers, you know, the mindset of we need a digital transformation project? Really, really, really good question. And, and all of the above. So everything you've outlined and what Ken said, the thing is that the triggers from my point of view for transformation can be multifaceted. And it, it could be the COVID situation we've got right now and organizations realizing, holy cow, you know, we've got a client at the moment we're working with where multi-million dollar company, uh, turnover company, as a result of COVID, if they don't go digital, they have to shut their doors, like literally have to shut their doors because they can't operate. And so you have those situations. You have the situation where, as Ken said, you know, you have the top, uh, the bottom up approach where it might be a sales rep. It might be someone out there who's seeing something different. Maybe they're seeing the competition use a te piece of technology they're not, and they're raising that awareness and bringing it up the uh, the chain of command. It could be from top down, top uh, top down to bottom. So where it comes from it, it is quite diverse. Now, I don't want to uh, go too deep into strategy development and strategy discussions here. But one of the things that Ken said was really, really, really powerful. At the heart of every single strategy really is the customer. And in fact, I'd go as far as expanding on the word customer and I would say stakeholder. And so as a business, as an organization, what we need to be doing is at all times, we need to be looking after the stakeholders, both external and internal. So we've got the external who could be your shareholders, who could be your actual customers or clients, they could be your suppliers, it could be government agencies, et cetera. Then we've got the internal stakeholders who uh, amongst a few include your own staff. And so transformation exists to uh, make the life of your internal stakeholders more meaningful and more engaging and, and better, so for your staff, but it also exists to make the engagement more meaningful and easier and better for the external uh, parties as well. So for me, transformation has always come back to the same thing, which is the human being in the middle and the, the asking that question of, are we as an organization doing as best as we can in serving our customers and their needs, looking after them? And are we doing the same thing for our employees as well? Because I can tell you now, if you're a business that looks after the customer really well and looks after your own staff really well, it'll be much harder for you to fail in the marketplace. It'll be much harder to fail in the business itself. So that's probably where I'd be focusing the initial strategy development and then everything else, you know, sort of mushrooms out around that. And we all know we've got the four major pillars that sort of support a business. We've got operations. So that is all about how are we delivering and what are we doing to deliver upon our promises to the customers. And these promises are made through sales and marketing. So sales and marketing is all about communicating what we do and, and trying to connect. Uh, then we have the human component, which is all around, well, how are our people delivering and meeting those delivery expectations and the promises we're making? And then of course we have the financial component because you know, at the end of the day, we can come up with the best digital transformation strategy, right? And it's the same thing with sales and marketing. We can come up with this amazing strategy, but at the end of the day, if the company or organization can't afford it, what's the point? Or if there's no return on investment adequate enough to warrant that, then you have to ask yourself that question of, well, what's the point? So when we're looking at transformation, it starts with a strategy to, that addresses these four components with the human in the middle. And only when all of these are aligned and do we and, and when we understand where we want to go, can we then think about, okay, what do we need to do to get to where we want to go to? And that's the transformation uh, process itself. And that's where, you know, we have project management come into play to manage the deployment of the, the transformation itself. So anyway, I, 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 anything? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting that when you when you talk about it, it makes you realise. I mean, you mentioned marketing back there, and it's you know, 25 years ago, we were trying to convince our clients that advertising wasn't marketing. All the budgets went to advertising; it had to be on television, on the radio, in the newspapers, wherever. But they they had not nothing else. They were just advertising, and advertising is just a tool of marketing. And you now 
we're now talking about digital transformation, which I think is just part of a whole transformation process. Mm. You can't, as you say, and as Ken said, you can't just come along and, and sort of enhance the company with all of this digital um, transformation that you're about to undergo without all of the other things you've, you've spoken about, the people and, and the economics and so on and so forth. So for us as business analysts, it always starts with the end game. What is the goal? I mean, it may, it may well be, there'll be companies out there that, that with digital will not be a part of their transformation process. Correct. They just won't. Be. Yeah. So digital transformation is just part of the whole change management process. That's, that's how I approach it. And I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in digital transformation. If I need to know anything about any of that, I just ask you, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically, that's, that comes back again to what you, how you started this. You started talking about not everybody is a digital transformation expert. Not everybody really knows what they're talking about. So the very first thing you do is separate science from or fact from opinion and talk to people who do know they're talking about correct but I, I think from my point of view with all of my clients it starts as the the, as the end game what are we got to achieve here and let's work back and figure out how to do that yeah that's exactly right the the thing that separates the true professional in my opinion is quite simply this and then there's other things you know implementation etc but for me what separates a true professional from the others is the fact that a true professional will be willing to put up the hand once they've done the initial review and say, you know what, Mr. or Mrs. Client, we're actually going down the wrong path. We actually don't need this because I've certainly worked with organizations where you get engaged to do this transformation or some digital project. And within a few hours, I'm sitting back thinking, that's not what you guys need. We're so far from that. And so that's the important thing. It's, it's really important to recognize that Yes, it's, it's, it's exciting to get all this buzz around digital transformation, but the first thing you really need to understand is whether you really need that in the organization or whether the issue that you have is simply a change management issue from a human point of view because you might have some underperforming staff and you're thinking digital will fix it. Well, that's not, that's not correct. We all know that digital is not going to fix your underperforming staff and there's other other issues there. It could be that you have issues with your business partner and you're trying to mask it. It could even, even be that you've got some serious cash flow issues and you're thinking, all right, digital must be the quick, you know, easy way. It's the quick, easy fix because, oh, you turn on a website and it starts making you money. So the first thing is really understanding the strategy and the strategy when we're going through that as a process always uncovers the elephant in the room. It always uncovers the true problems. And so then as a professional, you know, we have to know what to say to the client. And if it's not digital transformation, no problems at all, we'll go down whatever path we need to. And at some point in time, we might come back. And as you said, Chris, for some organizations, you know what, it could be so far in the future that we might not even think about it for three, four, five years. That's, that, that's the reality. Um, so the thing is though, so once you understand your, the, the strategy and you see that, okay, we've, we've got to do something as a business to get to where we want to get to. The next step isn't, is not to jump in. The next step is really to understand uh, what is the scope of what we're trying to do and what are we trying to fix? Now, how this happens in the real world is quite complicated to explain in a short sort of uh, podcast, but what we do as consultants is review and analyze the four key pillars and understand the challenges in those four, four key pillars and use that information to then understand what our next decisions are going to be in terms of or what our next recommendations are going to be. And in many cases, for example, what I've seen is that if it's not a human issue that we immediately need to fix, in many cases, the issue comes to a process problem. So most of the time, businesses have issues because of process, whether it's inefficient processes, outdated processes, whether it is no processes at all, ad hoc nature of stuff, that's what I normally see. So usually what I find is if you don't recommend human change as the initial component, we then undertake business process re-engineering as the next step. And that's where we really dig deep as consultants and we understand, okay, well, what are you doing? And then ask questions such as, should you do that? Shouldn't you do that? How do we eliminate things, et cetera, et cetera. 
and it is a quite a, a complicated deep mapping process. Um, does anyone want to add anything further to to that? I mean, we've all gone through this sort of BPR exercise over the years. Um, Peter, is one of the questions you asked, what are the challenges you currently face in your process or is it working well for you? Does that question have any value when you're looking at business process for engineering? Uh, does it have value? Very interesting question. It's got value in the sense that it can help you understand how the business owner and the team is thinking. But in terms of value from an output point of view, not really, because you've got to dig deeper to truly understand. You know, it's sort of like, um, how do I, I, I say this? Sort of like the analogy, you go to the medical doctor and you've had a niggling pain and they might ask you, for example, where's the pain, what sort of pain? And you might, you know, point here and say it's a dull pain that's been happening for a while. And that sort of gives you guidance, but it doesn't actually give you anything specifically more. And so you need to do more investigation on that pain or on that uh, area in order to truly understand what's going on. So process re-engineering and reviews are actually a process of questions, 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 and more questions. And it's digging deep, 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 deep. And really the, the fa fundamental concept that I always think of is, um, I don't know if, if anyone's heard of this, it's the uh, five whys. It's the why, 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 why. So the concept is that you ask a question from someone, they respond back and then you say, okay, why? And it forces them to dig deeper. And then they give you an answer back and say, okay, but why? And so in theory, by the time you get to the fifth why, you sort of get to the really at the heart, the crux of it. And that's why if you go back to strategy, why the strategy is important because Strategy is the why, 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 why. And same as process review. You go, why, 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 why? And then in the end you go, okay, well, initially they told us that this is the problem and this is why. And the reality is completely different to what they were admitting. And so you have to dig, you have to dig deep. And without doing that, all we're doing is surface and that's not adequate enough. Well, what, what's yeah. really interesting Pete, is that process without review is absolutely completely a waste of time. Mm. I, I started out very, very early after college in a strange and menial government task where I was, I was sitting at a desk for eight hours a day, matching up thousands of fuel dockets. There was a pink copy, a green copy, a red copy, a yellow copy. And my job was to make you know, all of these fuel dockets balance out. A guy drove a a car into a gas station, he paid for it with a docket. The docket came from him, the docket came from the gas station, the docket came out of the, the log book of the vehicle. And my job was to make four of these things match up and then balance the books. So there might have been a million dollars worth of fuel purchased in that month. If it was one cent out, one cent, that was process. I had to go back and do it again. I could be three days doing that. So to find one cent, I could have spent maybe, I don't know, back then, $40, $50, you know, looking for one cent. So that had a fantastic process that really worked, but it wasn't reviewed and it was a complete waste of time. I was the junior. I stood up and said, why are we doing this? We just burn all of this stuff and we save ourselves a lot of money every month. Oh, good heavens, you're right. So that was a case of process which was good, but never reviewed. It was done. It's been done that way ever since the automobile was invented, and that's the way we're going to keep doing it. So process and has to have it has to be married to review. Definitely, definitely. Ken, you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I was going to say that uh, I like what you were talking about in terms of using the five whys in order to really get to the root cause uh, of some some issues. Um, and uh, another uh, taking a bit of a step back, but it, it fits into this is is using a diagnostic, staying with your uh, doctor analogy, uh, doing a diagnostic uh, from the team and getting the anonymous input of, of a lot of people on the team because uh, with that, you can look at trends and you can look at, at what is going well and areas to improve. So Pete, can I ask you to share that, uh, that radar, that one of the of first documents? Uh, which is a, a radar that, that really goes and talks to things like 
the people issues of leadership. Okay, if you can see here, it's got clarity. It's got, and that means in terms of are all the team uh, aligned in understanding what is is the vision mm. of their uh, of their company and the products, for example, processes. Uh, the the performance are they really uh, being able to accomplish what they, they've set out to? Uh, leadership that could be on the technical leadership or on management, and particularly as it impacts uh, different customers. Uh, the culture in terms of is it open and and is it really empowering of the team uh, and the the foundation in this particular case because this is a an team agility health radar. Uh, it's really saying our people uh, respecting their roles and being able to work to, together collaboratively. Um, in the, this radar too, what, what you see is there's differing points that represent, in this case, a, a, a team of probably about uh, 30 uh, people. And it shows how each of them have rated uh, different subcategories of those overall dimensions that I just described. And by being able to average them, you see that red line that, that goes across and, and shows you which areas within the company are going well and which areas could be improved. Mm -hmm. And it gives you information as to where there is a diversity in view uh, of the team members. So. Uh, I won't belabor this, but, but diagnostic tools like this can be very helpful for, for getting to some of those root causes mm -hmm. and for, for understanding uh, the consistency across the team and in, in knowing areas that they can improve and that they can build upon. Really, Does that make sense? Uh, this is really powerful, Ken, and I'll just sort of add this in here. For those of you who are listening to this uh discussion via podcast what we'll do is we'll share this image as a link within the podcast or within the, the uh, Alexa or relevant company websites so you can actually download uh, this particular tool and you can uh, have a look at it for yourself but as Ken said this is the power of having tools available is really really powerful now when we're looking at digital transformation for the larger organization, especially if, you know, Ken, you were saying that this had uh, like 30 team members, this is probably where I would actually start the, the project. So you start off understanding your strategy and you've obviously involved your, your team in the strategy development. Out of your strategy will come a, a set of goals that we want to achieve. And as we break, break down those goals and ask those questions of, well, how are we going to achieve them? we may actually find that we have five, six, ten different projects within the transformation as a program itself that we need to complete in order to actually achieve the goals from a strategy point of view. And when we have those sort of situations, I always think the best place to start is a diagnostic like this to understand, well, where is the team situated? So that way you sort of evening out the playing field, you're trying to get everybody on the same page as much as possible. And you're aware as a leader of the challenges that may lie ahead. Because if you're not aware of what may, uh, may lie ahead, then you might be a year down the path, several hundred thousand dollars, you know, invested or millions invested in this project. And you're then wondering why you're not getting the outcomes that, uh, that you want. And that's usually because there's disharmony between, between the individuals on the team. Ken, did you want me to keep this up now or, or you're done with Yeah, well, just, just to fit, finish this off in terms of being specific on a, a, the client that I used this with uh, on the Gold Coast, so it was, a, again, a, a telco company. And, and what it did do, it, it, uh, and it helped to, to show that the processes that were most broken and that, that would add the best value were processes associated with uh, product management and with uh, project management. Mm -hmm. So from this and the uh, accompanying comments, uh, anonymous comments given, we're able to, to do the drill down into the processes that really would, would result in, in a much better experience for the team and much better experience for the customer. So, and with that, you can take that down, Peter. Thank you. 
<laughs> so the only last thing that I add into this uh, point here is that the other value of this is um, actually highlighting whether there exists a gap in the team or on the team from a skills and knowledge point of view. So it's well and good to understand where you want to go and well and good to understand that you've got these transformation projects, but you also need to know, well, who on the team is capable of managing the product, managing the project, et cetera, et cetera. And if you don't have those skill sets, this matrix can help identify, well, what do we need? And then that can help you identify what sort of consultants or external parties you engage for the project. So remember what I said earlier at the beginning that, you know, just because an agency says that they're digital transformation specialists doesn't actually mean that they they really are. And so if you understand your skill gaps in the organization, then you can go to market and seek the services of an agency or a consulting firm if you need to, who can align up with the gaps in, in your business. And that can work really, really well from a partnership uh, perspective. Also, if I could add to it, I think that within the digital transformation process, the business process review is perhaps, in my opinion, uh, the most important or one of the most important stages. Because even though you already planned your strategy, your, we can call it, say, a draft strategy, they will actually set the foundation how companies will move forward. And it also kind of links to what you said before, Pete, uh, this will business owners the idea of how good is the consultant that they're hiring for the digital transformation process. Mm. More often than not, I found that the good consultants, they actually challenge the process of the company because no company is perfect. Most of the consultants that they are not as good or they are not experts, they will just move forward with the current processes that the company has. But the good ones will actually challenge you on, okay, why are you doing this? Is there any process you can do better? And then everything starts building from that point on, in my opinion. Really good point. And I think it's, um, uh, it's like a discussion you and I had far a few weeks back, I think it was with you, just around a particular client. And we were talking about their existing processes and how they kept going back to their existing processes and referencing back to it, even though we're undertaking a new transformation project and the processes need to change. And it's about uh, the, the us as consultants understanding what change needs to happen, communicating it, but then also making sure that the management team are continuously uh, buying into it and actually they're on board as well. And they're not referencing constantly back to the old because it's right. just the way that we've been doing things. What we're trying to do is unravel the way they've been doing things. Exactly what you're saying, Carlos. So we're trying to get them to understand and identify that often the way you've been doing things, unfortunately, is not the best way to do it. It's the worst way for you right. because it's more com most comfortable from a behavior point of view. Change sucks, but there are better ways. Sorry, Farah. Uh, so I think that's that's the most uh, important thing is as, as a business holder, a uh, business owner, or a stakeholder, you know, you're challenging their status quo. You're challenging their their methodology. Mm. So it, at some point, it may feel for them like you're personally attacking their way of doing things. Uh, so, you know, rather than take it personally, you've got to step back and say, we've hired this consultant on to actually help us get to the next level. So let's, you know, play along and see what they have to say. Get out of your comfort zone, because a lot of times that's the first step is getting out of the comfort zone and keeping a very open mind. And that's a challenge for people to get past. Um, I think once they, once they get to that point and they understand, you're going to be questioning everything. If you're... If you're there and you're, and you're really solid as a consultant, it is your job to question the status quo. It is your job to ask them those uncomfortable questions and get to the point where you can give them good, solid guidance that will help their business grow, improve, and, and really step forward. So, you know, again, it all comes down to mindset. We talked about this on the last call as well, right? How do we stop holding ourselves back and, and be ready for that change? And mentally, are you ready for that change? There's uh, so one thing that I'll add in here is that I would love to do one of our future podcasts to talk about how to become an advisor and how to provide advice. Because if you know how to provide advice the right way, and we sort of know how to how to 
groom the client and bring them along the path, then you find that your engagements become a lot easier because the client accepts what you're saying and they're willing to challenge their own paradigm. The, the, the challenge is that when we're talking about a, uh, a very masculine individual, and often it's the men who are self-made, multimillionaires, you know, they've got very successful businesses and they might see the consultant who comes in and they might think, well, what are you doing here? You know, what are you telling me what to do when I've already made my millions? And sometimes you butt heads to an extent with an individual like that. But if you know how to manage that and if you know how to provide the advice the right way, then you can actually turn their mindset. Um, probably the other thing that we should all talk about right now before we move on is one really important part of any project. It's all part of project management and it's part of what we do as consultants. And that is to set the right expectations and then to make sure that we're continuously reaffirming those expectations. Because one of the things that I found through you know, years of, of doing this and making the mistakes is that if you set the incorrect expectations, if you can't meet the expectations, you're going to leave a really nasty taste in everyone's mouth by the end of the project, even if you think the project was successful. So um, I'd love to hear you know, from, from the team, how do we manage expectations? What's the best way that we can manage this so that the project is as smooth as it can and what they expect will happen is actually going to be the thing that we're delivering as, as consultants? Yeah, that that's a really interesting one. I um, I'm I'm like the bringer of doom at the beginning of a, of a difficult transformation process. I because you know where it goes, and I, I hark back to my old granny used to say, "You can't make an omelet without breaking eggs," and it's it's very much like the mentoring or or an, or an analyst process where you've got to break things. You've got to break down. People get upset. People think you're there. They think you're there to fire them. They don't know what you know what what you're there for. So it starts with making the person who's appointed you the business owner or the CEO, whoever it might be. It starts with that person fully understanding that the process will be difficult for a lot of people. And before we even set foot out onto the floor out to, to meet the team, that person should have presented his vision for the company, his expectations for the team and what we're there for as analysts and, and consultants. Why are we here? So that people don't go away with these false notions that, you know, that you're, I'm in your sights. What are you looking at me like that for? I mean, because it's a hard process. Mm. Quite often, you know, people don't engage well in it. People that haven't been through these processes, they find it very difficult. So I usually find that after we've finished our, the actual review process, before we move into uh, implementation and moving forward, I, I call that the positive phase and I get everybody back together again and say, right, you've done all the hard yards, now we're going to start seeing the rewards because we're going to start building this thing again. But, you know, I mean, it's fair to say, Pete, as you know, that probably 20 or 30 percent of client companies fall off the wagon in the hard process because for all the reasons you mentioned, they, they don't engage the team and they certainly you know, there's a lot of ego. I mean, a company that's very successful, um, you know, but times change and, and a year in business is a lifetime. And even the most successful businessmen should never stop learning. And so, you know, as I say, as I said at the outside, I'm the, I'm the bringer of doom in the early days. And, and if they don't like it, then that's the time that they should get rid of us because we're not there to to bring them good news. We're not there to do what they want us to do. We're there to tell them how it is or they're wasting their money and they're wasting our time. And you never get a result that way. Good point. Now, so, if uh, one of our clients is listening, Paulette, <laughs> Paulette knows she, she sort of uh, keeps saying, oh, you're always so, you know, you, you, you bring the reality back to the dream, don't you? Um, and look, that's what we do, you know, and, and that's as, as a true consultant, that's what we've got to do that we've got to bring back the, the reality in terms of the expectations. And I always say to people, OK, we're going to go down this path and it's going to be fantastic as an outcome, provided we do everything the right way. But just so you know, there will be problems, there will be mistakes, um, there will be challenges and we will at times be pushing things uphill and it may feel like it's easier to stop doing it. But that's the reality and the, and the nature of project work, especially bigger sort of yeah, transformations. Um, so I, expectations, mindset, that's critical throughout, 
throughout the project. And that's why we've got so much, so many touch points throughout the project and talking to internal uh, champions and stakeholders, et cetera. Um, so we've spoken about developing the strategy and then looking at, okay, do we make certain human changes or do we move forward with, with process reviews? The next step usually is to review everything that we've got once we've completed certain activities and understand, well, what are we going to do to move forward? Now, in some instances, the transformation is relatively straightforward. We know what we need to achieve and we can start straight away. In other circumstances, especially with the bigger organizations, we have an idea of where we want to go, but we don't know how we're exactly going to get there or the project is so big that it's just not feasible to go, right, we're going to do everything straight away. So oftentimes you break down the big program of, of things we want to do into individual components and we might use a ranking system to work out which projects are going to be the quickest uh, win, low hanging fruit, which I always like to say, and they're the ones usually we like to move forward with. Um, certainly from a project point of view, Ken, you've probably got one of the most amount of experience on, on the team around this. How have you seen the large programs being broken into chunks? Yeah, with the, uh, thank you, with the waterfall uh, approach, it is really taking a portfolio look at the, at the various projects, uh, understanding their, their, like we talked about at the last uh, webinar, the, uh, what the value of them and the benefits that will be achieved, the costs and the risks associated with that. And using that portfolio criteria to really understand and schedule the ones that are, are most important and also understanding some of the dependencies and, and uh, links the, between the, the different projects. Um, and because it, it's very, it can be very dynamic, uh, that needs to, to be reevaluated um, at, at an agreed pace, whether quarterly or, mm -hmm. or even more often than, than that. Uh, within an agile scrum type of, of approach, it's similarly doing the prioritization that you were just talking about, uh, but breaking it down in terms of uh, epics with what they use in, within the jargon of Agile Scrum, of epics, features, and user stories to similarly understand what is the most important value that will that needs to be addressed uh, now. Um, so whether you use a traditional waterfall or an Agile Scrum uh, approach, it's doing that periodic review of what's most important and uh, and knowing that life changes. So if I could put it another way, then for, for the business owner out there that isn't familiar with uh, these sort of project management methodologies, methodologies, I'd say think of it in the in the sense of business cases and think of the big strategic goal you want to achieve um, and breaking that into sizable business cases where you can look at things like how much money do I need to invest, how much of my my staff, my staff's, staff's time, uh, contractors' times, consulting time, resources, et cetera, energy to achieve an outcome and what's the value of the outcome back to the organization. And as uh, Ken said, when we're looking at multiple projects, you also have to understand how does this particular project or how does this particular business case then affect and influence or enable or stop future projects? And really, when you're looking at the bigger picture, you always have to be also understanding what, what are the ramifications of doing this versus doing that. And sometimes, this is what I say to business, uh, business owners, is you've got to stop looking at everything from a how much it's going to cost point of view. Because if you all you're going to ever do is look at the dollar, the initial investment, you're just not going to get the best outcome. Because sometimes you are actually better off spending a bit more money. But by doing that, you've then sort of uh, enabled future events to happen much more seamlessly, much easier. And perhaps you're going to get a stronger return on investment. Um, Far, is there anything else you wanted to add to this? Because you know you, you've certainly got a lot of project experience as well, and we've we're like at the moment we're working on projects where we started off with a project consisting of two key things, for example, in, in the project that I'm thinking about, and now we ended up having to split it up, and we've got the main component and we've got stage two component potentially starting. 
Yeah, I think like the, the phrase, you know, don't bite off more than you can chew comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, if you try to tackle everything at one go, it can just sort of go in many different directions and lose control over the project. Um, back to what Ken was saying, it's really important to identify your dependencies between departments, between processes, between systems, and make sure that you have a solid game plan for your project. Um, taking digital transformation at a technical level, you try to address too many systems at one time, too many processes at one time, it can just end up becoming a runaway project that would take eons to do. It's mm -hmm. really important to understand who, who you're trying to address, who you're trying to impact, and how you're going to be doing that, and taking it into smaller size projects. Whether you use, um, you know, first you take the program and you say we're going to break it up into projects, and then you take a methodology and say, with this project, we're going to apply the agile methodology and we're going to do it step by step. Reevaluate is what we think coming next, really what needs to come next. So as you, you know, go further down the project path, you analyze and you say, we've accomplished this much. Is this enough to really give us long-term traction? Do we really need to address the next part of the project? Is it going to give us the gains we thought it would? Or is this enough? And we, we need to stop. Mm. So be open-minded to that as well. What you start out with a game plan may not necessarily be the plan you continue with. So be okay with those changes. That's, and that goes back to mindset. It goes back to those expectations, right? It's constantly yeah. massaging the client, the team, and making sure they're aware that it is okay if three months down the path, we're changing a direction. That's perfectly fine because that's just the way the world is. Things change and things evolve. Um, yeah, and I think that goes back to what you said about expectations, right? Set that expectation up front because, uh, again, what Carlo said, this is a draft. We're working, you know, and it's an ever evolving draft. If we don't get into the habit of review and refine, we're going to fall into the trap that we, you know, finish a year and a half long project, and at the end of that, we realize that maybe half of those things were not critical, you know, in the end game. Very, very true. And so, one thing that we've certainly seen uh, stuff up projects is the next step, which is often uh, we understand, okay, we want to move forward, right? And it might be great. Let's uh, let's build a new e-commerce platform. We're going to change the way the organization operates. It's not just going to be e-commerce, but we're going to have all these other different things we're going to do. And then often what happens is that uh, certainly within the amateur organization, how do they start building? And they actually miss a really critical step, which is to scope the project which is to actually invest the time and energy to dig deep into understanding what exactly is it that we're getting built. If someone says to me, I want an e-commerce website built, I go, right, okay. Why, why, why? And then you dig deeper and then you try and understand what are the things that they actually want? What are the features? What are the things we're trying to achieve? Um, and Farah, you do this, uh, you know, really well because you always pick my, my things apart and, and, and the challenging, but that's, that's what we need to do. We've got to challenge ourselves uh, with that. So Farah, what's what right? just a couple of minutes on how do you scope projects? And then I'd love to hear from you as well, Ken, from a scoping point of view, because I think we all sort of, we, we do this, but we all do it quite, quite differently. Um, I think when you talk about scoping, you have to understand not just what you're trying to accomplish, but why, why you think it's important enough to accomplish that and who are you affecting. So in my opinion, I would say, let's say you're building a website and I'm going to talk about technology projects that we work in. Um, so I'm trying to build a website. Well, okay, at a high level, who are you building it for? Is it a B2B customer? Is it a B2C customer? And what is your goal, your end goal with that project? Well, I want to be able to sell 250 products online, for example. Um, so if, I think the clearer you can get with your scope statement, then you know that at a high level, your business customer is there. You have some idea and you set that expectation up front. Everybody is on board with what you're trying to accomplish and agrees with that goal. And then from there, you go into the business of the why, you go deeper. And then if you feel like there's enough business that's what we're talking about. Now, what do we really want? Let's get to the high level and then the granular level requirement. 
That's exactly right. So one thing that you rightly pointed out, uh, and you sort of said it in passing, which is actually a really important fact, is that you've got to revalidate your scope with the client team. And so you've got to go back to your client team and um, make sure that that, that it, it is relevant, it's correct, and it is what they were expecting or thinking about as well. Because again, from a change management point of view, if we just go down the path of here's your scope and they haven't come on board and, and along the journey, there's a real risk that the people will actually not be part of, of the project. I think similarly, um, in terms of scoping, either that oftentimes a requirements document in, in traditional projects um, is, is kind of neglected. And sometimes it's a half um, double gook in terms of marketing uh, fluff and then some, some technical detail. So a well-written requirements document that says this is, is really what we understand uh, the, the customers need is really key. Uh, within Agile and Scrum, they, they talk about those in terms of being user stories, mm. in terms of being able to really be clear on, on what's going to be delivered. So prototypes are, are very valuable in terms of that scoping, even if it's a preliminary hand-drawn one or mm. something that is, uh, uh, is, is a mock type of, of prototype, that can be really helpful to make sure that there's agreement on the scope and capturing it with diagrams uh, is much better than, than just sometimes the, the written word, which mm. can be lengthy and, and cumbersome. Uh, the other thing that, uh, in terms of scoping, that's really important is is to lay the foundation at that point, so that then you'll be able to go back at the end and portray the traceability of it from what was originally planned at the beginning to then what was delivered. Uh, and so, scoping is very important uh, because it, things do change, and that has to be to be captured uh, effectively. Uh, otherwise, scope creep can kill project. And so, what what you're basically saying is that uh, so we got to tell the story and understand the the different mechanisms in terms of how they line up and what we want to achieve. So, in fact, what it means is we've got to go back to the process side of things and make sure that the process reengineering or the process review was actually undertaken and done the right way because. Uh, the web requirements document, if we're talking about a website, or we'll call it a systems requirements document or scoping document, whatever you will, in effect is the foundational base off of which we build the project. And in fact, as we go along the project, we reference back to this document on a regular basis to see, okay, have we addressed all of the requirements that the client or the project is requiring at this point in time? Now, it doesn't have to go really, really utter granular because the utter granularity often only comes out uh, as a result of doing and implementing and, and you go down one path and realize, oh, that's not the right way, we'll go down this way. So you keep it at a high level. But as you said, Ken, if you don't have a, a requirements document, you're really uh, risking the entire project itself. Best case scenario, you'll burn through more cash and you'll still get a good result, but you can actually manage that. Um, I'm going to dig out, uh, I've, I've done a fair few presentations around uh, process review and I just want to find an image that I've got here. So just bear with um, me. Peter, can I add something? Yeah, go for it while I'm doing this. Um, so going back to what you and Ken just talked about, the scope statement, I think a lot of times, um, even when we talk about uh, change management within a project, that's a good time to also look at any possible scope creep and make sure that it fits within the scope of the project. And if it doesn't, you know, don't feel um, shy, don't shy away from saying, hey, this doesn't fit within the scope. Why are we talking about this change? And how, you know, just help me understand how this is going to really benefit the project before you introduce any change to the scope. The other thing that I have seen um, successful consultants do is not only do they have a scope statement, but they clearly define what's not in scope. You know, what would we consider out of scope? So you don't just talk about the inclusion, you explicitly mention the exclusion so that everyone has a clear idea, the right expectations are set, and then we can bump against that list and make sure that we're, we're agreeing and, you know, or disagreeing 
and flesh those things out even further. Yeah, that's a really valid point. All of, I, all of my scoping documents I always include, because you can see scope creep all the time, I always include the obvious things that are just going to fall right in there for me. And I actually carry them beyond the scoping document into the implementation plan. And I have them in red, marked up as out of scope. So as soon as the mention of a, why haven't you done this or shouldn't we be doing that, you know, it's all listed and there can be no arguments. So I think it's really critical. And the other really interesting point about scoping documents and requirement documents is that I always try to build in because it happens a lot is that you've got to, I always write it into the document that we have an utter reliance on the client's involvement and engagement and ensuring that his team is engaged because that is quite often a problem. I mean, if you're, you're trying to complete part of the scope of works and you can't get anybody for three weeks, it's really difficult. So I always have, you know, a, 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 I always shine a bit of a spotlight on that area at the very beginning as well. Because it's really critical for us. It's hard for us to work, you know, if the client's not working with us. Yeah, it's important because what's what happens later is that they forget what was in scope and out of scope if they're not used to relaying, you know, uh, referring back to those documents or those, any documents whatsoever. They're used to what they're used to, and when we bring in these new documents, they've probably never seen or they're not familiar with. We have to keep referring back. So there have been projects that we've worked on where. Um, they, they're wondering why certain things aren't getting done. And we told them in the beginning that it was out of scope. And, and he was like, no, I really think it should be uh, included in that. And, and we, we just had to remind him why we had it out of scope in the first place. Your budget is X, your needs are Y, we need to be, you know, we need to keep this in order. Otherwise it's like, okay, we can pause. If this is really crucial, let's have a meeting, let's rearrange some things. Maybe you didn't see it the same way in the very beginning, but now we're having to retrace steps. So are we doing the best for the project for the business or do you just want your idea in, in play here? So we have to identify with the priorities. Yeah. It's interesting. The other thing that adjusts the scope of works massively, and Peter mentioned this right back at the beginning, he spoke about the elephant in the room. I mean, we finish, a, we obviously, honestly, we frequently finish our, um, our strategic review or, the, or our first analysis knowing we haven't got the whole picture. We know there's another issue, but it could be personal, it could be a partnership agreement, it could be any of these things. But, you know, we demand to know what, before I leave the room today, is there an elephant in the room? And that doesn't work. Sometimes it does, but generally it doesn't. And in the middle of the scope of works, we're functioning, we're getting along with things, and all of a sudden it comes up and we find it. And it just radically alters the scope of works, in, particularly in big change management projects. So, yeah, it's really critical how we, how we manage our clients' expectations in that regard. Well, it goes back to the way that we manage exactly, as you said, the clients, the expectations, but it's also the way we provide the advice. And there's been more than one occasion where you you could just see it that there's just something and then you just feel it, you know that there's something um, and someone's not talking about it. And in those sort of instances, there's been more than one occasion where we'll take a break and in the break, I'll take the client offsite and we'll go have a coffee and we'll go have lunch together and you have a banter. And then there's certain ways that you can bring up certain conversations. And often it is through those sort of banters that you can actually get the reality out of them because sometimes I don't want to talk about it because it might actually be and we've had issues of bullying for example against business owners or it could be because there's two partners or three partners within the business and they just don't get along now they don't want to tell you in the room because well shit they're all together but as soon as you can get them into a non-confrontational environment one-on-one -on -one, they tend to open up or you might have something where I've had one particular client where they had some serious personal things going on that I wasn't obviously aware of in the, in the early days. Uh, and they didn't want to mention because in the strategic meeting, we had management, we had some of their lower level staff and they certainly didn't want anyone to know what was going on from a personal point of view. But as soon as I got them in a one-on-one -on -one environment, you can get the, the information out of them. So, you know, it's really important. We're sort of, we've gone so far forward with the discussion, but in fact, we're coming back to the beginning that we need to be understanding the reality is and we need to make sure that we're uh we're aware of everything as much as possible 
um, before we're, you know, $300,000 down the path, six months burnt, and then you realize, ah, I didn't ask that question, for example. Um, um, Peter? Yes, Farah. So I, have, I have a question for Ken. Um, Ken, what are your thoughts about documenting assumptions? Because a lot of times when we talk about scoping and we're yeah. talking about in scope and out of scope, um, you know, have you come across folks that would rather document assumptions or, or not? Because what happens is if the assumptions change, the scope can yeah. change and what you end up delivering can, can drastically change and the project can get real. Yeah, you, you bring up a very good point and, and assumptions are very, very important, particularly if we're talking about uh, that this project or or this this initiative is dependent upon the input from another division, for example, who at one point in time, uh, perhaps their middle level manager uh, agreed to it, but then th that person got booted up to a better role or something, and somebody else came in and didn't have that collective knowledge. So, so some of those uh, assumptions are, can be really overlooked. And particularly when it, it comes in, term, in terms of uh, project costing, uh, in terms of resources, that it, it, unless you document the, those assumptions, then uh, one is able, one ha is exposed to the risk of then somebody saying, well, wait a minute, you need another business analyst. And, and, um, and so come up with it. And, and it's only when you're able to document and show that the assumption uh, in that financial spreadsheet showed that that uh, was going to be handled by a resource from another department, uh, for example. Those types of assumptions are very key and oftentimes overlooked. So you bring up a very good point. The landscape also changes. So, you know, this isn't a quick process. And we have seen as well where, as you said, Ken, someone gets identified in the other de department and maybe it's assumed that they're going to be in charge of whatever that is that, that they've got to do. Uh, but three months might have gone by from the initial sort of strategic discussion and three months down the track, that person's left the organization. So there's, there's a gap there. But the assumption has been made that this person is going to fill it. But now we've got a blank seat. So, you know, how do we handle that? What do we do? Um, and, and that, again, is all part of why we go through a process like this, because when we're looking at uh, human beings and people moving in and out of an organization, we've got to be fluid with our expectations. We've got to be fluid in terms of knowing who's going to do what. Now, once we've completed the scope, uh, can, yep. I, I was just going to say one way that a lot of organizations stay on top of that, because life does change, so it, it would be a naive of us to think that it doesn't, uh, is oftentimes in terms of whether it's on weekly or bi-weekly reporting on projects or initiatives, uh, they oftentimes use traffic lights to, to say, uh, here is things are going well in terms of this dimension, like resources, it's all green, or it, it can go to uh, orange and uh, when somebody has been, hasn't been replaced and then potentially goes to a, a, a red uh, traffic light. So one is able to stay on top of those uh, violations of assumptions and the change in circumstances by having those planned meetings and being able to communicate it in, in a very visual way so that everybody understands, well, that has really gone red now and we're really, uh, we need to address that. Sorry, Pete. No, no, good point. Good point. And that actually highlights why it's important to select the right transformation partner, why it's important to, to select the right agency to work with or consultant to work with, because if we're just assuming that a web agency can do this, there's a lot that, that we're assuming. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, hey, don't work with web agencies. What I'm saying is work with the right agency for such a big, big project, because you've got to be able to manage these movements of people in and out. It's, it's absolutely critical. Um, and as Ken said, there are regular reporting periods, and that's really important, bringing everybody onto the same page on a regular uh, basis, asking the questions that we need to ask so that there's no sort of deep, dark holes that we're going down in, which we're not aware of. Um, what tends to happen is uh, once you've got your scoping done, we can then move to the next step, which is really the, the true beginning where you're looking at the different systems, identifying 
the different platforms, talking to agencies, consultants, etc., and using the documentation that we've just sort of developed to guide you down the path of who should you work with and who should you select. And there's certainly pitfalls you've got to be aware of in terms of the selection process. And we won't talk about that today. Maybe that's going to be another podcast one day, talk about, you know, how do you select the consultant? What's the right consultant for you? Um, but I'll throw it out to the team, you know, can we have a, a couple of sort of key pitfalls that you've, you've seen as, as, a, as professionals out there over the years when it comes to selecting consultants and agencies? I would say looking at a web company would not be what you want for a growth strategy. I think that a web company would be like a tool that you use to produce a product or an outcome, like the website itself, but they may not have the, the key skills uh, that are going to ask the right questions and pay attention to the right yeah. um, priority. So getting a consultant uh, or a digital uh, transformation specialist that's, that wants to talk to you, the business owner, the entrepreneur, about your priorities, about your growth needs, and has a strategy that can be implemented, executed, or whatever, and brings in the templates and the documents and the questions and stuff like that, and says, okay, now let's go find a web. They may not have or be attached to a web development company. They do what they do. Um, so I would say that there needs to be a, a, an understanding that there, there's a clear delineation between the two entities. Uh, sometimes they're large, sometimes they're not, but we're looking for the guy who can run the growth strategy, have that in mind, and play that role, and then go find the team to perform the, the duties of the, of the project. Good point. So if I want to get my get a house built, for example, I could run out and get a builder and they'll just give me a house, but chances are that without the architectural blue, blueprints and without the architect kind of guiding the discussion, we'll get a house and I'll look at it and go, okay, that's nice, it's a house, but it's not really what I wanted because it doesn't have the toilet here and it's missing this, this, and this. So is that sort of what you mean? Yeah, yeah, and, and the architecture is is probably the best way to, to visualize that. It's it's the guy that sees the bigger picture. And if, you, if you're not talking to somebody that sees the bigger picture, you're gonna find out real quick. So yeah. if you could ever talk to somebody that is an architect of some kind that sees it, it has dealt with multiple facets of business or or the technology, and you, you can hear it in, in their conversation versus a guy that only specifically talks about the one thing, you can see the specialty here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually true. And that's, I think one of the things that I'd say to listeners is, is that, uh, and I'm sorry to have to say this, but beware the software vendors because, you know, the software vendor will come out and say, yes, we can do all of this sort of stuff. But really, they're touting a particular product because there's a direct benefit to them. And as you said, James, you know, you really need to have a bigger sort of picture and approach to what you're doing. And, and I say the software vendor because often digital transformation projects mean that we need to be talking with third party vendors who have already built something that we can utilize. It's not always all about going out and doing this custom stuff. It's often selecting the best products that exist in the marketplace or software and having the right sort of stack, if I can put it that way, and the stack talking, connecting. Uh, with each other. Um, it's always a versus buy scenario that always needs to be analyzed. Do we need this and how does it need to play a role? Yep. You don't have to build everything in custom. That's, you know, we're dealing with one guy now that just didn't know any better. He didn't go research other options and decided to go find a, a, a solo gunslinger developer and get started. And, you know, several thousand later and, and months later, he's still not done. He's frustrated. He doesn't know, you know what's going on. So yeah, there, there, there needs to be a discussion. There needs to be some difference. Yeah. Yeah. I had a client in the last 12 months who was, we sat down and we spent a lot of time on our strategy and analysis and business values. And the entire success of the business was founded on their price value proposition. They were a reasonable price, but they bought great added value, you know, very, very much hands on value to the clients. And uh, as we went, started looking at their agencies and things, we discovered that that they were paying a web development company about $5,000 a month to manage their SEOs and so on and so forth. And that was a huge amount of money for a very small business. Um, and when you looked at the website, it was totally at odds with their price value proposition. It was just lunacy. It was all price, 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 price. And 
flashes and bells and things like that. So, yeah, what you say, James, is really important. I mean, I, I there are a lot of one man consultants around and um, you know in every area and a, a really good there can be a good one man consultant i'm not saying there can't be but a really good consultant who's a one man operation is a project manager he may be specializing in digital transformation or he may be specializing in marketing or change management but if he doesn't know how to bring the next guy in for that role if he tries to do that himself instead of bringing in the experts and he doesn't have a network it generally ends in tragedy um, very important in that example i just want to reflect back on something so you said uh an example where uh they're paying five thousand dollars a month uh to get the marketing and it's actually contrary to what the website is saying now from a strategy point of view when we're going right back to the beginning part of what strategy will do is actually identify that as an issue because you would review the brand assets and things like that and in fact, what you would say is, okay, well, we may start transformation, but at the same time, what we're also going to do is we're also going to go through a communication and brand positioning exercise where you say, right, let's say in that case, we're going to redo the website and build e-com into it. At the same time, we're also going to review your branding from a, a, a positioning point of view to make sure that from a marketing strategy point of view, from a growth strategy point of view, what you want to achieve is what you're communicating across all of your channels. Um, so, and that's why I was saying that sometimes it's not the transformation we need to do. And in fact, in that case, there might actually be no transformation because the advice might, might actually be, you know what, your problem isn't your systems. Your problem is that you're saying one thing here, one thing here, and that's just not working. So that, that's a good example of where strategy can actually find that early on in the piece. So you're not yeah. wasting your money on things. And that, that was pretty much the case. I mean, we went looking for the company. I took along another consultant who was a, uh, basically a process guy. I thought we needed two of us. And we couldn't find the company because their website and their logos didn't reflect with their, their site. They had an old logo. Oh, you know, we didn't want to spend 20,000 painting out the building, you know, so we, and you couldn't find them. So that brand, the whole brand management thing was wrong. Everything was wrong. The reason that we were called in was to solve a problem that actually didn't exist. And it was a relatively easy, low hanging fruit, Pete. It was relatively easy for us to fix the problem once we got in there and saw that, you know, they were just not delivering on their own promise and you know, it worked well, but, you know, it's a problem. So, um, yeah, that's one of the ones that I've encountered quite recently. Yeah, and we've seen that quite a few times, those sort of sort of challenges. Now, uh, we've spoken quite a lot about project management in this hour and a bit that we've been uh, talking about. And I think what's, what's probably becoming apparent for the listeners is that uh, while digital transformation is a mindset, it's also a process of discovery and then implementing things. And the best way that you can implement the technology is through the process of project management, because project management really is all about controlling an outcome. So controlling the situation now in order to achieve the outcome that we, we want to achieve. And so true success uh, with the transformation lies both with getting the strategy right and aligning with it, lies with the human beings and getting them on board. And then it also lies with using the right project management uh, methodologies and actually following the right project management uh, structures. I've certainly seen projects where we had phenomenal ideas, but it actually didn't work well because project management wasn't uh, as rigorous as, as it should have been. Um, have you guys experienced anything different to that? Have you seen perhaps these situations where the ad hoc approach has actually delivered something fantastic and phenomenal and no project management? I'll, I'll give a quick example from an insurance company that I worked with uh, last year. And that is uh, they had used kind of a, an ad hoc a technical project manager, uh, but the technical project manager on, on this website for international students uh, neglected many of the stakeholder and change management uh, issues and didn't have enough power to, to really bring in the resources, uh, the right resources on the team. Uh, and in this particular case, it was like James was talking about, uh, wasn't able to bring in even a part-time enterprise architect or a solution architect, et cetera. So, so 
it is important to have, and, and I guess I'm biased uh, as is uh, Farah, in terms of having a good project manager because it involves upwardly managing uh, the, the key stakeholders and downwardly managing to make sure that the technical team has all of the resources that, that they need uh, to be able to accomplish what, what they've set out to, to do. Well said. And um, I, think, I think I've seen it both ways, Peter. There are some pretty good uh, freelancers out there that are on the ball when it comes to managing small projects. So when I say small, I'm talking about they're dealing with a small company, they're dealing with a small scope of work, and that one-to-one -one communication can actually be pretty good. Uh, the moment we start upticking the stakes, though, things just go, you know, in all different directions. Just yesterday, we had a call with a developer, uh, the same client that James alluded to earlier. The client's saying, well, you promised to have this done a week ago, and where are we? It's been, you know, two weeks. So even something as simple as developer, you're committing to having something ready. I'm not going to wait till that day to find out, are you ready? I'm going to ping you before that day mm. and find out, are you on track? So that's a very different tactic. And that's such a basic thing that, you know, a, a technical person may not even think about. They're going to tell you at the end moment, well, I know I said tomorrow, but in truth, I'm not ready. You know, that mm. shouldn't even come up. And I think that's the difference between just somebody getting a project done, living day by day, milestone by milestone, and a project manager really being the forward thinker, looking across and seeing what's coming up and, and making sure that there's a plan to get there. And if there is a possibility of us not getting there, well, what are we gonna do to make sure that that date doesn't slide? Mm -hmm. Things like that, just simple strategy. Well said. And unfortunately, sometimes it's the so-called easy things. And I'm, I'm not saying planning is easy, but what I'm saying is that it, that it can be easy if we've put some structure around it. It's these sort of things that people drop because they think, oh, planning, I'll just keep it in my head. You know, I can remember the dates. Come on. Why do I need to write it down and document things? And same thing as we, we said before, we pointed out assumptions, you know, and we've all heard this, the, 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 that saying that, you know, assumptions are how dangerous they can be and uh, <laughs> if you assume too many things we know what it can lead to so the worst thing we can do is is actually assume and if we are making an assumption that we have to document it um, and same thing with anything within the project we need to document it we need to plan for it and if i recall a conversation we had as a group recently around covid we were actually talking about risk mitigation and in fact that is something that we should always be doing within a project as well, that we need to be looking at, well, what are the risk factors? Where are the areas that we could potentially uh, have this project derail? And if it is to do to go down that path, what are we going to do as project managers or as consultants to make sure that we mitigate against that possibility? So we need to have other things identified. In the web world, for example, let's say we're working on a project and we say, okay, this piece of code is gonna do this for us. And then we realize, ah, it doesn't actually work. It's about having backup pieces of code or plugins or options to then just go, okay, that didn't work, we'll go here, we'll go here, etc. And so that then, then takes me to say that, well, along the way, what we need to do on a continuous basis is two really critical things. One is to communicate with everybody on the team on a regular basis, and two, be continuously testing our works. It's not enough to wait for the project to finish and do one big final test, but rather, and this is where that sort of agile iterative, iterative approach comes um, in play, where you're continuously evolving and testing the, the little pieces to make sure that they are functioning how they should. Um, Ken, do you wanna add anything more to that? Because you, you're certainly the, I'll call you the agile guru on the team. And really this sort of iterative testing and approach came out of the, the software world, didn't it? Yes, uh, yeah, it, and it's really saying that uh, sometimes because we we live in such dynamic times as we know that being able to prioritize showing examples of what we're building is much more valuable than, than just the documentation. Not saying documentation mm -hmm. isn't important, but uh, this is more important. And, and part of that is also, as you're alluding to here, is the continual in, uh, improvement of our processes uh, within uh, project management for 
or working together effectively as a team. So that is uh, some people every two weeks do reevaluate what did go well within that last two weeks and what areas can we candidly and respectfully uh, improve on. And by doing that, by building in that, that ongoing continual uh, improvement, Mm. It just makes all the, the difference. And, and that's really the, the summary of what Agile and Scrum is all about, building in those feedback loops. Mm. It's interesting because if I put on my human hat uh, from a HR perspective, that's sort of what we do as, as people managers, isn't it? That, that we're sort of continuously reviewing people's performance. We're continuously setting the expectations. And that's the, if we look at the, the process of uh, performance development, um, that's pretty much where, what we're doing. So we're saying that well, let's implement some of these uh, procedures from a systematic point of view as well, of review, evaluation, what's worked, what hasn't, making changes and making sure that we're going down, down the right path. And so if we've done this from a digital transformation point of view, then uh, theoretically over time, we're getting closer to the end point. And as we get closer to the end point, usually you conduct more rounds of testing, things get more pointed uh, until you get to a point where everyone's happy with everything and we can sort of go live with the project. Now, I'd love to do a, a podcast at some stage about that whole process of going live because that's also an interesting, uh, interesting topic because it's, you know, again, it's not as simple as going click and now it's magically live. It, there, there is a process to any project, how you go live, how you hand over to a client, what do you need to do? What are the pitfalls and, and, and things like that? But eventually you want to go live and you want to take product to the market. And once you've done that transformation doesn't finish because then it's the continuous revolution, evolution and change management that, that sort of follows uh, any good digital transformation project. Um, does any, anyone else want to add anything to that sort of stage of the discussion? Can I jump, jump in quickly and just take what Farah had to say about um, establishing sort of waypoints and milestones along the way. And I'm going to turn the whole thing upside down and put the responsibility for a lot of that back on the client. We go into a client's company and um, they, they buy a product or they buy a service from us and we say, this is what we'll achieve. We scope, uh, we, we go through all the process of their expectations and so on. And in the, it's really different when you're dealing with big global national, multinational companies, there's always this process of follow up from the top down. But in the SMEs, most of these guys are busy running the company and they effectively don't I mean, I, I, t as an analogy, you know, in change management, I do a lot of leadership training and executive coaching. And if I'm teaching a, a, a prospective leader how to delegate, the thing I do is I say, you need to set milestones. You need to make sure this is happening each step of the way. And I, I'm stunned sometimes in the SME area that clients don't protect their investment in consultants and analysts and, and the people that are trying to do the, you know, get the work done for them in holding them more responsible. Um, you know, Farah's point's a really, really important one. You don't get to the end of the day and then say, okay, are you finished? You, you ask on Wednesday whether they're gonna be done on Friday. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I find that the big difference between somebody that's, somebody in a, in a big global company that's been appointed to manage you, know, you as a consultant or your project um, as opposed to the SMEs, and, and you know, it's not a—it's not necessarily a criticism. It's a fact of life mm. in in those businesses because they're intertwined in the businesses. But you know, I, I think we need to build that into our scope and and you know into our uh, expectations that the client has got to be involved in these processes and the milestones along the way. So it leaves us out on the cold, out in the cold as a consultant if the client doesn't engage correctly. So that's a really important thing for me, I find. Yeah. Well said. So yeah, I agree with what you're saying, Chris. Um, sorry, Peter. Uh, and I think Ken, Ken brought this up as well. The a lot of times, even in companies, I have seen where this the subject matter expert, the technical lead, you know, gets sort of. The, the hat of project manager as well. And that's uh, 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 a dangerous 
do ultimately then to is trying to take on two responsibilities. A lot of times they're conflicted because they're managing the team. They don't want to come down on the team too hard because they're they're so close to seeing, you know, okay, things are developing. But then from a project manager perspective, they're not asking the tough questions as to, okay, we know you're progressing, but you're not progressing at the pace you should be. It's important to keep those roles separate. Uh, again, at a small scale, small business, if you're a single business owner, you know, you're trying to get a developer to do this project for you. You can't be the project manager. I mean, to a certain degree you can, but then how are you doing your business responsibilities and playing project manager? And even at a small scale, on a one-on-one -on -one scale, you can immediately see that the business owner is so busy doing their business stuff that they don't get to check in with the developer. The developer is talking one language. The business owner is talking another language. And then the business owner gets thoroughly frustrated just throwing their hands up in there and saying, this is not the way I expected. Um, everybody starts off with the best intentions. You know, The developer has the best intention to give you the product that you need. The business owner has the best intention to get this thing going and build their business off of it. And then somewhere a breakdown happens. And that whole relationship goes so sour that neither party is happy, the project is not progressing. We see that on a small level to a large level, small business all the way up to multi-million dollar businesses. And the best way to fix that is have the right people doing the right job. If you have the right people there doing a completely wrong job and you can have the wrong people doing what should be getting done. And it's not working. So again, it comes down to finding the right person to do the right thing. In order to do that, though, you have to have some kind of a process of vetting. Yeah. There has to be. There has to be a uh, vetting process. There yeah. has to be a process where somebody can identify and ask the right questions in order to find that person. I, I, are you the person that should be doing this, or you know, are you just filling in the shoes because nobody else is there to do that? So that's yeah, the, biggest, so the biggest thing. Back a few steps. Okay. So then goes mm -hmm. right back to the beginning and asking. From, you know, strategically, where do we want to go? What do we want to achieve? And then from a human point of view, what does your team look like? What is the skill set? What skills do we need? Um, so that when the project commences, we're not asking that question, but in fact, we've asked that question right at the beginning. Uh, and yeah. that's why sometimes yeah. we say that in fact, transformation isn't what we start with. Sometimes it's the, the human bit we start with because we're not ready as an organization because as you said, Farah, I might be that gun ho business owner that just wants to own everything, control everything. Well, you can't, it's just not going to work. So that's when, you know, we, we get the team in to say, right, let's coach and mentor that particular business owner or CEO, change the way they're thinking before we can actually do anything because they, we know that they're going to be the things that hold up the project anyway. So there's no point starting the project until they're ready mentally. So, yeah. and you're right. You're right, Pete. Once the review's finished, we've then got fabulous tools at our disposal. We've got, Ken spoke about the radar tool, and we've got, you know, KSA interviews. That, that is a time when we can absolutely establish the dynamics of a company and who, who we should be talking to and who the superstars are. And, and at that point, we can begin to understand, as I say, with the team dynamic or the company dynamic in place, we can start to see how, how to put this thing together and we can ask the questions we need to ask. So it's uh, really interesting, I think, and, and hopefully for the listeners as well, that we're sort of getting to the uh, tail end of the discussion and we're sort of now gone almost way back to the beginning again to talk about the people and the selection of it. So there's a really powerful message in that and, and that's that this whole digital transformation, yes, we're talking about the technology, we're talking about project management, et cetera, et cetera, but really it's the people that really matter and having the right people is, is the key, whether it's the right people on your team, whether it's the right mindset for the CEO, the business owner, the decision makers, uh, or whether it's the, the bringing in the right consultants to, to make it achievable and make it all work. So if you're a business owner out there and you're thinking, okay, this is something that I need to investigate further, uh, what should you do? Well, the first recommendation that we have is to really understand where are you going as a business? What do you want to achieve? So if you haven't got a strategy developed, that's where you start. I'd recommend talk to the right consultants, talk to us, our team. We can certainly assist you going through that process. And once we've identified the right strategy, we can then help you and guide you as to whether you actually need to implement a digital transformation project or program, or whether in fact it's something else within your business that you should be addressing as a priority in the meantime. So 
I want to thank the, the team for taking part in today's discussion. I think it's been really fruitful and we've gone quite deep into things. And that's exactly what we're, we're going to do with future podcasts and, and uh, videos as well. So if you're going to keep tuning in, we're going to go deep into the topics so that we're providing some really value, uh, some really good value back to you. And on that note, I just want to say that if you're listening to this on the different socials, please give us a thumbs up, like us, share, make a comment, shoot us an email, shoot us a message, let us know what you want us to talk about in future episodes. Tell the world about us. And uh, we've hoped that uh, you've enjoyed this podcast and video and taken some valuable information out of it. So from all of us, thank you very much for listening in today.